do that. If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Isaiah, Isaiah 24, and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Isaiah 24, beginning in verse 11. The Bible says, There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. In the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree, and as the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. They will lift up their voice, and they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord, and they shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify ye in the Lord in the fires, even in the name of the Lord of God of Israel, in the isles of the sea. Dear Lord, we thank you for your precious book. Lord, we thank you for providing it in a language that we can understand and that we can love. God, we pray this morning that you would bless this word to those that are listening, and we give you the praise for it. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, maybe some not-so-familiar verses of Scripture. I've had this Bible uh, for 13 years, and I mark in my Bible when something is preached on, and I have no marks in it. So that means I personally have not heard it preached in 15 years. And uh, somewhat obscure and maybe a distasteful group of verses because as many of Isaiah's prophecies, it predicts the judgment of Israel. And uh, as we know, they did not listen to Isaiah. They went on in their own folly and, up to, and ultimately was judged just as he predicted. But there's a great message for us in the church age that is very applicable to us as it was for them. In verse 11, the Bible says there is a crying for wine in the streets. Now, in lieu of the great judgment of God on the nation of Israel, instead of crying out to God, they wanted wine. You know, in the judgment of the last day, as Brother Jared was preaching about this morning, uh, just right in there where he was reading, he never really hit exactly on it. The Bible says, I think it's in Revelation 17, that they would cry to the rocks to fall on them, to protect them, to do, hide them from judgment. So instead of crying out to God for mercy and grace, there is a generation that cries out to rocks. They would rather see judgment than embrace the person of Christ, and we're there. Here we find a very uh, singular type of scriptures where they can have the soothing balm of Christ and the Lord God Almighty. They instead want to get drunk and dumb themselves down from the judgment of God. We're there. Uh, in 2022, we've arrived where the, the world is saying the same thing. And many times, what their wine is is not the wine out of a bottle like it's under this pulpit, but what it is is a smooth thing. You know, the Bible, I think it is in, uh, maybe in Revelation, maybe not, a, uh, I can't remember, it says, teach us smooth things. They did not want to hear the portion of God that dealt with sin. And with that cry today, you know, that's what I see, is a lot of preachers preaching smooth things. They're preaching the easy stuff. And they're preaching wine. Uh, they got people dumbed down. You know, if you look around at our public school system, uh, I mean, this nation's in a mess. Yeah. They, they have dumbed our children down. They're, they've not improved their intelligence or improved their ability to, to self-study. They've hindered it. And so we find that in this day of judgment, instead of addressing the problem, they want to be drugged up. This is a crying for, there is a crying for wine in the street 
all joy is darkened. Now, uh, and I hope after 20 plus years now that uh, you understand the fruits of the Spirit. And this is number two, the second fruit of the Spirit, their joy was darkened. Now, each and every one of us, under the sound of my voice this morning, certainly can identify a time in their life when their joy was darkened, where they were not happy, where they were discouraged and down and out, uh, good news, uh, about bad news in their life, about the situation that we live in the modern day, could be many, many, many different things, but their joy was darkened. And, uh, hey, we're there. We're there. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, devil the devil certainly knows that he can't touch you. Yeah. So he'll take away your joy. Mm -hmm. he, 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 he'll certainly make your life that ought to be victorious a miserable one. And that way, uh, he feels like he has won something in that. And so... In this uh, situation with Israel, they're looking for the wrong remedy, and their joy is gone. The mirth of the land is gone. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I read up on this mirth because I thought perhaps it was um, maybe like a balm, uh, some kind of oil. No. You know what mirth is? It's laughter. You don't see a lot of that anymore, do, do you? La you know, just, just being joyous. Just enjoying the person of Christ. We do not see that in 2022. Uh, we see misery. We, we, we see difficulty on every hand. And you know, it comes down to this, apparently from the situation that these folks were in, no repentance, no joy. No being sorry over sin, taking an elemental uh, way to deal with sin, there's no joy left. There, there, there's nothing there for these people. Verse 12, the city is left desolation. Now, there were two desolations there. The first, of course, being Physical, the city was torn down. We're going to see that their their gate was gone. Uh, their 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 mode of protection no longer there. But I want you to see in, in a a spiritual sense, in the very uh, the very same way, uh, their spirit was desolate. It was empty. There was nothing there. That's a sad, sad spot for a Christian to be in. Mm -hmm. You know what I found out? Uh, when nothing is there, you can't do a whole lot. You think about going without food for three or four days. You don't, you don't have the joy, you don't have the energy to do anything. Same situation here. There is crying for, uh, excuse me, in the city is left desolation. The gate is smitten with destruction. Now, what is the problem when the gate is gone? Well, the enemy can get in, right? Yeah. True. How's your gate? Has it been left, left wide open? Is it even there? Does the lock work? We talked about that just a little earlier, me and some of the men after Brother Jarrett's lesson. And uh, remember what, um, prior to the attack of Job, the devil's thing was this. He had built a hedge about him. Yeah. See, if that's true, there had to be a gate somewhere because Job had to be able to get in and get out, right? Yeah. Job's gate kept him out. And huh, our gate is Christ. Amen. He'll keep the devil out as long as you have a gate. As long as you're near to the gate, as long as the gate is working, you don't have to be worrying about the stuff. But we see Israel had the exact same situation and they got into this condition anyway. You know what? You can be redeemed. You can be saved and be in this very same situation. 
the gate gone, the door's wide open, fully ready to be under attack by death, the devil himself, and not, not even concerned about yourself enough to pray. That, 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 that is national Israel here, and very frequently it's us specifically. Uh, verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land. In other words, when this is occurring, when you're in this condition, when this is where you're at, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land among their people, there shall be the shaking of the olive tree as the gleaning of grapes when vintage is done. Now, I want you to see in this, Israel being what they were, the church being what it is, and mankind just being what he is. When, when, when? I need to know when this is going to be. He says when it's the harvest time. When the grapes are ready, when it's about time for harvest, this is what it's going to be. So trouble at harvest time. We're here. I, I, I fully believe the harvest is very soon. I may not live to see it, but I believe the harvest is soon. See, the problem with mankind, we count time as we count time. And God's on something totally different. But I want you to see the earmark that we have is it's going to be close to harvest time. Now, I don't think that means the fall harvest of, of the United States, but it's going to be near the end. It's going to be when the harvest of mankind comes. It's going to fall apart. Things are going to be difficult. Things are going to be hard. And instead of turning on to Christ, we have people turning onto the bottle. We have people leaving the gate open. We have people living <clears throat> with no joy at all. That will be the hallmarks of the last day. Verse 14, they shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Now, there is where we should be. You think about it, uh, and I don't know about you, but a couple of times I have, and I don't know if I shouted, probably should have, but I've been so overcome with the majesty of the God we serve. Every little thing under his feet. What a glorious, glorious majesty. Listen, a gnat don't get in your eye without the very permission and plan of God. What a majesty. What a glorious, glorious God we serve. And we sit back and we get miserable and we let the devil steal our joy when we serve the very maker of the universe. God help us. What a majestic, wonderful God. Amen. Far above our thoughts or thinking. His ways are not our ways. And so we find in the midst of destruction, God's people were to worship. They were to give Him glory and honor and as the seams were ripping apart all around them. And I want you to say they were even to cry aloud from the sea. I'm not real sure what that means. I don't know if there was island places out there where Jews were living or if it was just the sea creatures giving him great glory and honor. That old great fish did, didn't he? He vomited out Jonah exactly where he needed to be. He, that's glorifying to God, wasn't it? Said that he made the same trip. He says, you got three days to get down there, and you know what? With the help of that fish, Job was right on time. Yeah. Can you imagine every little snippet of the universe giving glory to God? We, we forget that all these things are under his element. Everything, a sprig of grass giving great glory and honor to God. That's where we need to see. When we see the majesty of our God, listen, our troubles will not melt away. Uh, it won't seem obscure anymore but we'll understand and know exactly who he is. Verse 16, from the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory in the righteousness. But I said, 
My leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously, yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Now, I'm assuming this is Isaiah speaking, or it may be the voice of Israel. I'm not sure. But in the midst of the glory of God, they got the boo-boos. Treacherously, treacherously, oh, oh, how treacherously. You're in the midst of the Almighty. How could you feel that it's been treacherous? How can you feel that, 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 that something's wrong? In the very presence of the Almighty, they began, <laughs> God help us. Listen, this gig is not up yet. Be happy. Be glad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Listen, we're here, and our assignment while we're here is to spread the gospel. And the Bible says, when you talk about some Baptists getting their eyes perked up, lift holy hands everywhere. <laughs> See, we don't have to be in the honey drummies. In fact, from this text, I think it's a sin. It's not a condition. It's you relinquishing your joy to Satan himself. The devil can't take your joy. You hand it over to him like a dollar bill. It's ours. It's the second fruit of the Spirit. It belongs to us. And we walk around like we're uh, eating some sour grapes. God help us. We are to be a joyous people. Now, every one of us have been in this condition, this, uh, if it was Isaiah or National Israel, which I think, and that's just my own opinion, National Israel's uh, answer to this time of praise was the humidrummies. Every one of us gets there. Now, as displeased as I am with that among God's people, it's happened to me. You see more walking out than coming in, it gets down. <laughs> you, you know, as a pastor, it took me many years to, to appreciate this or to grasp it, I guess. When someone leaves, you think, what did I do wrong? How did I offend them? And a lot of times you have nothing to do with it, but you can't help but think that way. That 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 is the burden of pastoring. What what have I done? But <laughs> there's no need to abide in that place. Do we believe God is sovereign? You know why they left? Because God wanted them to leave. It had nothing to do with you. Now, uh, little snippets and people getting mad, sure, but that's just the vehicle of, uh, of God accomplishing his mighty, wonderful will. If the unbelieving depart, let them depart. Right? And, and so we see that very often the devil don't steal our joy, but rather we relinquish our joy. We give it to him. We say, here it is. We uh, take all you want. And then we, like Israel, began to grumble and groan. That's exactly what happens here. Now, so in the mid part of 2022, what's the remedy? What's the fixer? Now, first of all, Review yourself and do a good spiritual self-examination, whether you have the joy there or not. Um, sometimes I don't know we even know what joy is. Um, but look at yourself and see if you're happy. Now, I'm going to give you a few things that we can be happy about. And if nothing else can make you feel better, this one should. First Thessalonians, first 
Thessalonians chapter 4. We see the glorious catching away of the Lord's people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I've read this many times uh, at funerals, but listen, this is not just for the dead. This is just not to the people that we're putting six feet under. It's for us. It's for the living. It's for God's people in general. Uh, verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant. Now, uh, this is the condition of God's people when, devil, when the devil has stolen your joy and that it, it leaves us ignorant or uh, without knowledge. Now, ignorant isn't stupid. Ignorant isn't uh, being able to, um, to learn things. Ignorant is not knowing things. Now, um, have you ever forgotten something? Have you forgotten where you put something? I'm going to put this up. That way I know exactly where it's at. And then you're like, oh, where did I put it? I was looking to the title to the 51 yesterday. And I thought, I know I put it somewhere good. And it took Donna to find it. And, and, and we're very much that way. And uh, don't hide your joy. <laughs> So you can't find it anymore. You see what I'm saying? Don't don't tuck it in a place where where you can't even enjoy it yourself. And, and so we find here that don't be ignorant of praise. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not. Now. Again, we see that thing when we, when we lay people in the grave. Some people say lay them to rest. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, we're burying people. We're not laying them to rest. The Bible says let the, bury, the dead bury the dead, right? Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong. That's what we're to do. That's what God, give, uh, that's what God did for Moses. Gives us a a stamp of approval of that and how we should deal with the dead. But at the same time, I want you to see that we, uh, we, are, not, we are not to stay uh, in the mind of just this is it. Th th this is it. He says, <coughs> I don't want you to sorrow in that. You, you know what really the opposite of joy is? Is sorrow. Right? You know what another word that is comes from sorrow? Sorry. Now, I'd whole lot rather to say I apologize than I'm sorry. I've met some sorry people in my life, haven't you? See, sorrow will replace your joy. Sorrow will destroy your joy. You know, uh, nothing that happens and nothing that's going on around us can, can interfere with our joy unless we give, give it credence, give it authority to do so. But once we say, yeah, sorrow, I embrace you. Sorrow, I prefer you. Sorrow, I want you. So let me move joy to the side so I can bring sorrow in. Now, this last day that we're going to be living in, church, is days of sorrow. Are you going to move it in and move joy out? Or are you going to put a, put, put a strong door there and say, Devil, you cannot take my joy. You're not going to replace it with the counterfeit. You're not going to replace it with something that I, as the Lord's child, have no use, to, uh, use of. He says, I don't want, I, or you let sorrow in. Don't sorrow even as others which have no hope. We have the greatest hope there is, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope lies within him. What could be better? And that was Paul remind, Paul's reminder to those who had died in the faith. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
Now, let me, let me give it inside here because I think it's Paul also, maybe to the church at Corinth, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He wrote the very same thing. So what is this thing that many denominations call soul sleep? First of all, let me tell you assuredly, it's not real. There is no soul sleep. There is no place where you will not be cognizant of what's going on around you. There's heaven and there's hell. That's the two, that's the two places. If you don't believe that, read in the Gospel of Luke one more time in chapter 11, the story of the rich man. Uh, immediately, we're with the Lord or in the punishments of hell. But what these people wanted to do is ask about the body. What happens to this flesh? What happens to this thing that we now abide in. And, and so with that question, he was answering the believers at Thess Thessalonica uh, very clearly. And he was saying, the body sleeps. The body's in the grave. The body is what le is left behind. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which the sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Nothing again outside the power of the Almighty. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, don't let grief, don't let grief snatch your joy. Now, uh, I was talking to Brother Junior about this yesterday, and uh, we were talking about different things, and uh, so, and I think I've actually talked to John about it too. It's weird, especially considering Judy's been dead almost 11 years, which is just beyond my understanding. But I miss her more than I miss Mother. Where, where, where could you possibly find joy in that if they're not redeemed? You, you know what will steal your joy? Just sitting around and thinking, I'll never see them again. Oh, is me. Right? You know what? I ought to be excited. Judy said she was saved. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just have to go by what she says. And you know what? Is that, if she was, my joy is that I will see her again. What's your joy this morning? He dealt with the most tragic thing that the people at Thessalonica were dealing with, and that was the death of a loved one, the death of a mother, the death of a sister. What, 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 what are you going to do in this situation? So the remedy is this, not focusing on now and here, but focusing on what lies ahead. What, what, what is going to happen in the future? Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Oh, what a wonderful time. I, I, I'm excited to think about that. It's enough. Come up here or whatever he may say. That's what he said when he called John uh, the apostle up to receive the revelation. I don't know what the Lord's going to say. In, in the Corinthian letter in chapter 15, uh, Paul says he'll blow a little trumpet. And here we go. What, what a wonderful, glorious time. Listen, I'm looking forward to it. That's my only hope. That's my only, uh, that's my only encouragement in the day in which we live. Listen, I will be with Jesus. Is things going to get hard? You betcha. Are they going to get harder? Absolutely. But you know what? God is still on the throne, and I'm listening and waiting. What could be better? I, I'm waiting for the call. Uh, you know, a lot of times we stop listening, don't we? 
You ever, you ever been, and, and this girl at work, uh, I really, really like her, but she listens to 80s music all the time, just cranked up. And all four of us are in a little office about big as this thing right here. And I mean, my head will be just thawing. And the girl that sits behind me, we all have our desk facing the wall, which I always thought was weird, but anyways, I didn't design the office. And uh, uh, sometimes Michelle will go, could you just please turn that off? Now I try to return frame from it, because you know, I'm the new kid on the block, but it's hard to be joyful when all you're doing is listening to the world, isn't it? Yeah. When all you're doing is listening to the muck and the mire that this world knows how to put out, you know? And it may not just be trashy music from the 80s. It may be Fox News. Turn that mess off. Listen unto the Lord. See what he has in his, the consolation of his word. The trump's going to sound. With the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. They, they have a privilege. They have, they, they have something ahead of us. They're going to come up first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yeah. What, what a glorious thing. Can you imagine gravity turning loose and us going up? Uh, that, 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 that is just an amazement to me. Uh, for 53 years, you know, gravity has held me right here to the ground. But one day I'll go up. One day, see that's breaking the laws of nature, isn't it? And our Lord Jesus Christ is so good at that. He he broke the laws of death and came and came valiant out of the grave. What a wonderful, wonderful thing when he breaks the very laws of physics. Isaac Newton wouldn't know what to do, would he? As we just bego began to lift off. See, that, that's a time that's real, church. That, that is a real event. How can we, how can you emphasize it anymore? I wish I could. Because you know what? Therein is joy. Understanding and knowing that we are going to go there is the best joy that I can offer you. It's the most, the most uh, wonderful news that I can give anyone is that we're going to leave. We're going to leave here. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And that's my attempt this morning. Don't be down. Don't be discouraged. <laughs> be joyful. As we see pandemonium, that, that's what's going on in Isaiah 23. Literally, the, the, the protected gate of Israel has fallen. Among that pandemonium, have joy, have, have grace. Now, last place in the book of Revelation. Revelation, very familiar verses of, uh, of Scripture, chapter 4. Revelation, chapter 4, John had just received the four church letters. Uh, all of them, not too good reports. Everybody gets on down in Laodicea where well, there was another one there that had a woman preacher. That's pretty rough stuff, isn't it? Only thing that got a good report was the church of Philadelphia. And then he comes to this in for the first verse. After these things I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as a trumpet, uh, which was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show you the things that must be hereafter. Now, just to give you some thoughts for this week coming, would you, would, would you, would you have went? <coughs> See, um, 
we as sovereign gracers want to say, oh, it's all up to God. Well, it looks here to me that John had to be willing to go up these unknown stairs, this into this unknown door. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he was like, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a, <clears throat> a rainbow round about the throne in the sight, like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads as, uh, as crowns of gold. What a spectacular sight. Now, I don't know if these were the tribe heads. Uh, some of them were pretty useless. Some have suggested that. But Reuben uh, was just, and Issachar was just as useless as three-legged horses. So I don't know why they would have got to sit there. Uh, you know, they, uh, after Judas died, they, they voted in another fellow to take his place, and he wasn't much better. So I don't know that we know who these 24 people are. But I do know this, they still had their joy. And we'll see that in a moment. And round about the throne there sat four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Some just suggest that's the seven churches that we're just talking. I don't know. And before the throne were, was a sea of glass up unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the, beast, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast was as a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings, and about him they were full of eyes and within, uh, and, they were, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which, had, which is and is to come. I want you to see the, eterni the eternal value of God, which is... And he is to come. He never stops. He always has been, always will be. And when the beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. So these four beast things that were about the throne, they give honor first. Don't you find that interesting? <coughs> it's sad when created things do better than us. Remember uh, uh, when uh, I believe it was the Lord Jesus' trip into Jerusalem the week before he died. And they were going, hallelujah, hallelujah. And they were putting their palms down before him. And uh, one of the apostles built it, did them to shut up. He says, if these don't give my, my praise, the rocks is going to cry out. Right. Isn't, it, isn't it sad that the rocks and, and the beast that's before the throne get ahead of us? And you know why? Because we won't do it. We, we just don't go, hallelujah! Right. So, he's going to get something to do it, ain't he? <laughs> You ever wonder where we got out of that, mind, that, that train of thought, that mindset? Well, I can tell you the Catholic Church did it to us. They set up the first way that the services go, ba-bum, ba-bum, ba-bum. Tennessee's church manual said that Baptists would first have a Sunday school, and then they would have a time of preaching, and then that would be it. Now, Pennington was a good man, but he listened. That's not inspired of God. That's just what he thought would be orderly. You see what I'm saying? This, this looks like maybe how it should be done. Right? And so we see, we see that this, this uh, glorious uh, event 
that the animals, those created things, came before us or before these godly men. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What a glorious, glorious thing. You ever wonder how things why things are. You ever wondered? <laughs> I've told you about mother's cousin, Freddie. Never spoke a real intelligible word in his life. He called his brother P. And his real name was Eddie. And that was the only thing they could ever attach. He actually attached E to Eddie. Why did Freddie live like that for 54 years? Hey, Mildred, give her entire life. She died two years after Freddie died, <clears throat> caring for Freddie. Why was that? For the glory of God. <laughs> it wasn't poor little Freddie and poor little Aunt Mildred. It was for the glory of God. Amen. I don't understand it, but I know that it was. All things, all things are for his glory. Why should we be sad? Why should we be twisting our hands? Where has our joy gone? Now, if you don't have joy this morning, you've relinquished it somewhere. Yeah. It wasn't stolen. You relinquished it. Well, get it back. Say, that joy is mine. <laughs> My God is on the throne this morning. And his son, my intercessor, sits right beside him. What could be better? What a position we as Christians are in this morning. What an advocate we have. Where is your joy?